can't remember when I didn't know how to read. I knew how to read well before I went into the first grade. My mother had read to me, it turns out, uh, as she would sit quietly uh, uh, because of her asthma. And uh, my grandmother uh, would read to me. Uh, I had a couple of teenage uncles. Everybody would apparently read to me. So I came out of that with great love of words. I believe I would have been a writer no matter where I was born, whether it was the, the West or Montana or whatever. I believe if I'd been born in downtown Dogpatch, I'd still be a writer. Good evening and welcome to the Friends of the Library fall event. <clears throat> this is called Living With It, Ivan Doig's Medical Journey. My name is Kenning Arlich and I'm the Dean of the Library. In 2015, Carol Doig decided to donate the collection of her late husband to the Montana State University Library. Ivan and Carol had put considerable thought into his legacy and wanted his collection to be as available to as many people as possible. As part of my proposal to Carol, I promised that we would digitize the, the collection in its entirety and make it available to the world via the internet. <clears throat> my staff thought I was crazy but they pulled off my promise in less than one year. There is nothing like visiting the collection in person, and we welcome you to do so. But the URL in your program, ivandoig.montana.edu, will get you there from your desktop. What you will see tonight is the value of a living archive. The Ivan Doig archive is rare on many levels. Rare because the entire thing is available in both analog and digital forms. Rare because the writer himself was so meticulous about keeping records of his work and his life. Rare because the archive shows that writing is a craft that must be worked, daily in Ivan's case, and that the writing was honed to perfection before the books were published. And the archive is rare because it intentionally includes documentation of Ivan Doig's medical journey. All of us face mortality, and many of us will face disease that shortens our lives. But not many of us are willing to talk about, let alone document, our last days. Carol insisted from the start that Ivan's medical journey be part of the archive so that people would understand what he was dealing with as he wrote his final four books. She wanted us to know what drove him, why he continued to work. We had some trepidation about this topic for a public event, but through our research and in talking to Carol and Ivan's friends, we came to understand that this is not a story about death. It is a story of perseverance and living one's best life. Tonight, our panel, our fine panel, will explore Ivan's journey in a discussion moderated by Dr. Bob Rydell, professor of history at Montana State University and co-director of the Ivan Doig Center. But a few additional points before we get started. First, many thanks to Jan Zuha, Ann Vinciguera, and Lissa Fields for organizing this event. They spent countless hours on it. And thank you to Phi Kappa Phi Honor Society students who contributed their time and voices to record some of the quotes you will hear from Ivan's diary. The students are Logan Gunderson, Colin Hammock, Sheridan Johnson, Rachel Jewell, and Ben Roeder. Second, while this is a free event, it did cost money to produce. If you like what we and our partners, Mountain Journal and the Ivan Doig Center are doing, please consider a donation. Our development officers from the foundation, Michaela Bader and Shannon Schumacher, would be happy to speak with you. Finally, this is a multimedia event that will include images, sound, and video. But our phones are not part of that event. So please take a moment to silence them. And thank you. And now please welcome Bob Rydell and our panel. So thanks very much. Now this is also a sound check, I think. So I'm going to look to the back and can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, yes. Wonderful. Okay, good deal. So um, thanks so much, Kenning. It's um, an honor for me to be here. It's a great pleasure. 
um, to be um, with all of you this evening. And what I want to do initially is to um, say a few um, words of introduction by way of um, presenting our panelists to you, and then we're going to move into the conversational phase. So just a few words, um, beginning with uh, Carol Doig sitting to my left. Um, there's a, a very brief biography um, in your program, and I don't want to just um, rehearse things. Um, by way of introduction to Carol, some words of thanks for your contributions to the archive and making Ivan's papers available. And also, um, thank you for making some of your own papers available um, through the correspondence, your work at Shoreline College. Um, it's really, just really, really marvelous. Um, one of the things I think you might not know about Ivan and Carol is that they co-authored a book. Um, it's called News, A Consumer's Guide. Um, it came out, I believe, in the 1970s. Um, my sneaking suspicion is that this merits everyone's attention again um, for reasons maybe we can leave unsaid or maybe not. Um, but it is really important for you to know that um, Carol and Ivan formed a remarkable, loving partnership. Um, their very good friend, David Laskin, is um, sitting next to her. Um, he is the author of Children's Blizzard, a prize-winning book about the awful blizzard that hit the Upper Plains in 1888. Um, and if you have a uh, sort of wonder what that might have been like, think yesterday. Um, uh, think 1888 and imagine how bad it was. And it was probably worse than that. Um, to my far right, my colleague, uh, Professor Brett Walker, uh, MSU Regents Professor of History and a Guggenheim Fellow. Um, he is um, renowned um, in so many quarters for his work on Japan and environmental history. And he is also the author of a quite um, extraordinary book um, called A Family History of Illness, Memory is Medicine, where he talks about his own experience with a um, quite serious disease. Um, Dr. Rob Patrick, sitting next to him, a physician at the Lewis Stokes Cleveland Veterans Affairs Medical Center. Um, he too is a recent author of a piece about Ivan Doig um, called A Doctor Plums the Depths of Ivan Doig's Illness, um, just published in the Mountain Journal. And speaking of the Mountain Journal, immediately to my right is the founding editor of that journal, Todd Wilkinson. Um, he's had a distinguished career as a journalist. He's written uh, The Last Stand, Ted Turner's Quest to Save a Troubled Planet, and he too has written an article about Ivan Doig's coping with the end of life issues that confronted him. So as for the structure of this evening, it's really pretty straightforward. Um, we are going to have a conversation guided by some questions. But I'd like to kick things off here by just saying a couple of things about the archive. So I'm a historian, and I've spent much of my life in the archives, and I spend a lot of my time trying to get people to understand why the archives are so not just important, but absolutely delightful. Um, one of my favorite historians who's written about the archives is Arlette Farge. She's a distinguished historian of um, French history, and she wrote one of my favorite books, um, the title, The Allure of the Archives. Um, how about that? Uh, and to give you a sense of um, how she structured it, she's, she works with judicial records, really dry, dusty records from the French courts and police records. Um, and it's the kind of thing that would put a lot of people to sleep. Uh, she delights in those records because they tell the story of ordinary people and their encounters with all kinds of travails during revolutionary and post-revolutionary France. Um, she says the archives can be very talkative. And I think that's a good way to think about archives. And you'll get a real sense of that this evening, I hope. Archives do speak. And you have to not just read them, you have to listen to them. And then she concludes her book with these words, and I'll quote um, them to you. The allure of the archives entails a roaming voyage through the words of others and a search for language that can rescue their relevance. It may also be a voyage through the words of today, 
with the perhaps somewhat unreasonable conviction that we write history not just to tell it, but to anchor a departed past to our words and bring an exchange among the living. And it's those last words, centering on the exchange among the living, that I think sets the stage for tonight's conversation. And what I hope is going to be a wide-ranging conversation with our panelists, we're going to move through a variety of topics. I'm listening on occasion to some of the um, quite moving journal entries from Ivan's medical journals read by MSU students. We're going to conclude the evening with a short video um, followed by some uh, Q&A from you folks. Then we'll adjourn for a reception afterwards. Um, and what I'd like to do to start things is ask Lissa if she could play for us uh, one of the entries from the Ivan Doig journals, and you'll hear me read out entry numbers, and these are for Lissa's purposes, so she knows which ones to queue up. So this is April entry 13th. 13. The date is April 13th, 2013. 2013. I don't want the diary to turn into a medical journal, but I'm not sure how much else I can manage as things are. I work on the manuscript from pretty soon after breakfast, done by 4.45 in my case. I see Carol has aptly described my nights as chaotic in her diary, my body routing me out, usually by three, through the morning, and then usually two to three hours in the afternoon, a heftier writing stint than I'd put up with if I wasn't saddled with Thal, Rev, Dex side effects. Thank goodness for the work the mental occupation, so I don't just wizen into an illness victim. But there's not much energy left after that much writing, so quite a lot of our doing goes unrecorded. So in case you missed the opening to that, it begins, um, Ivan's writing this, I don't want the diary to turn into a medical journal, but I'm not sure how much else I can manage as things are. So with that in your minds, I'd like to uh, turn to Carol and just ask you to perhaps say a few words about the journal, um, about the decision that Ivan made to keep that journal, and then also move towards finding out why you decided that this should be such an important part of the archive. Let me ask, is, uh, am I coming through all right back there? Okay, fine, thank you. Um, well, this was going to be a journey, but then life is, isn't it? <laughs> and so, from the time that Ivan was diagnosed, with actually a precursor to multiple myeloma, which was not harmful in itself, but he had looked into this in great detail, as you can imagine, researcher that he was, and decided that uh, he was likely to, it was likely to develop into multiple myeloma. And um, we talked about it and decided that we would go forward and live our lives as much as as normal as we could. And of course, we didn't know what was going to happen or in what time frame. But again, isn't that rather like life for most of us? I mean, which of us has a date on the wall that we know is going to come up for us? So in a sense, this was a perhaps a life within a life. And, um, and he went forward, and as it happened, um, he had eight years and three months. That's what it came out to be. And in that time, he wrote four books, and someone, uh, someone among us had said, well, wasn't it five? And that depends on what, where you put 11th man. The thing about the book process is that it is so slow in the production. And uh, so I'll give it that if you want. He wrote four or five books in those eight years and three months. And uh, put me back on track for the less. Oh, what was, what was the decision about keeping 
the journal. People who oh, are ill don't, don't always well, he, keep journals. He had kept a journal. And part of going forward uh, in life was to keep keeping a journal. And uh, I think that was simply part of him. It was part of his day, most days. And, of course, as time went on and he got sicker, uh, then he would write something like, I don't want this just to become a medical record. But uh, it was quite like him to simply report. I was not as good a journal keeper as he was. He, but uh, he, uh, he went about doing what he had always done as long as he possibly could. And I think that's the essence of his last years. Great, thank you. Um, let me turn to Rob because um, I think it's really important to hear from somebody who can talk specifically about uh, multiple myeloma. And so, Rob, this is an area you know a lot about. Are we on? could have just spoken into it. Um, hi, I'm Rob Patrick. Um, I'm a physician, as you heard, from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I got to give two disclaimers before I talk about this. One is I do work for the federal government. I'm a VA doctor. I'm not here on the VA's time. I'm here on my own personal time. So if you don't like what I have to say, please don't call your congressman and complain. <laughs> if you do like what I have to say, please call your congressman and ask for a raise. Um, and the second thing is that um, death and dying is something that I deal with every day in my career, and I have for 20 years. It's something I'm very comfortable with. Um, I've been on somewhat of a personal crusade in the last five years to get doctors to have better conversations with their patients about this topic. That's unique to me. I understand that that's not everybody's, not a lot of people are thinking about that every day like I am. If this dredges up something for you, um, that's, that's fine. Um, you know, please feel free to ask questions of me. I understand there's refreshments afterwards and I'm gonna be thirsty, so if you want some free medical advice, I'll be here. <laughs> so those are my disclaimers. Um, has anybody ever had myeloma or has myeloma or any of the plasma cell dyscrasias? Okay, so, um, so myeloma is a, a disease of the bone marrow, and it's uh, from a family of diseases called the plasma cell dyscrasias. And so plasma cells, how many people have gotten their flu shots this year? All right, the rest of you do it tomorrow. I just got mine two weeks ago, and my plasma cells are on high alert right now, making antibodies against that, that immunization that I got. That's what plasma cells do. They make antibodies against anything foreign that comes into your body. Um, and they're great. You know, they're great, thank God, because we'd all be dead of infectious disease in short order if we didn't have them. Um, but the problem with these dyscrasias, and, and Ivan had two different types of dyscrasias. One was this MGUS that Carol refers to, and MGUS stands for monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance. Um, and what that means is uh, monoclonal means uh, one plasma cell starts to divide in an uncontrolled way, and you get, and so it's a, what's called a clonal proliferation. So it forms clones of itself. It just replicates and, form, and clones itself. And the problem is that these cells crowd out everything in your, in your bone marrow, and they produce so much of this protein that it gums up all your other organs and causes all kinds of problems. Um, so what he had at first is this something that was causing a lot of protein in his blood, but they weren't sure where it was going, followed it for years, eventually it transformed into myeloma. And again, one of the things that's unique about this as a form of cancer is that most can all can mo the vast majority of cancers are divided into stages, one, two, three, four. Four is the worst, it's, it's metastatic, it means there's no cure for it. Um, most of the time, when you get diagnosed with a stage four cancer, it's not too long between the diagnosis and your ultimate demise. In myeloma, it can often be years, many years. I've seen patients survive decades 
or a decade, I should say, with myeloma. So as uh, Kenning quoted this, I like this quote because it describes, I think, myeloma perfectly. And it's a description of, of settlers on the Great Plains in the 1800s. And they said, well, the great thing about being a settler out here is you can see trouble coming from a long way off. The bad thing is there's nowhere to hide when it gets here. And that, I think, describes myeloma very well. You know it's coming, but it's inevitable. Um, and not many cancer patients are in that position. Not many people have that long to think about their end. And so having said that, I would like to reiterate what was said before, that as I read these journals and I talk to Carol and I think about Ivan Doig, um, this is a happy story for me. I know that sounds perverse, but we can get into it more. This is a sore story of a guy who was successful in his dying, and I've seen a lot of people not succeed at that and do it poorly. And that's not to say that he was happy to leave this earth. He wasn't, and certainly wasn't happy to leave his wife. But um, we can talk later about my own sort of personal epiphany about understanding how he thought about his disease and, and his death at the end of his life. Super. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, let's do, um, uh, Lisa, could we hear a couple of other journal entries? And could we hear um, readings from entries 3 and 14, please? May 14th, 2007. A note on how I look these days. Appraisal no doubt sharpened and darkened by the imminence of tomorrow's verdict. With my beard thinned down to a sufficient mustache and a translucent goatee, to myself I look markedly older, bat-eared, mightily bald-domed, and thinner. In the past year, the cords of my neck have begun to stand out, and with the proportion of my beard gone, I now look like I'm inhabiting my shirt rather than wearing it in the old known fit. October 22nd, 2013. This morning, I am a dex machine, struggling to get past grogginess from the 10.30 sleeping pill that buys me some sleep after taking the 10 little green meanie pills then. Along with the cloudiness in my head, I have the item by item sorting, fixation, whatever the hell it is, and now at a little after 6.30 a.m., have done the Revlimid reordering and the monthly phone drill, along with some upstairs chores. Again, I'm a medicated facsimile of myself, or what I could be, undrugged. And that's the way it is. And that's the way it is. So, um, Brett, I'd like to turn to you and just ask you to say a couple of things about your encounter with Ivan Doig, because reading your own quite moving book about your own illness, all of a sudden, there's Ivan Doig. How does Doig appear in the yeah, story? Um, thank you. Yeah, so I, about 10 years ago, I was diagnosed with a different sort of plasma cell disorder. And my uh, B and T cells don't produce gamma globulins. So essentially, I have the incapacity to produce uh, antibodies. and. Um, I began to think in a similar way about my own uh, experience with disease and mortality and was uh, very strongly drawn uh, to Ivan Doig's writing for a lot of reasons. I mean, one, as somebody uh, who was born in Montana, he was raised on essentially the eastern side of the Bridgers and had a lot of experience in places I knew. Um, he was a very compelling figure to me. I, we had a family farm in Cutbank for a while. And in this house of sky, there's a scene where he's on a cattle drive under an electric storm up in that northern part of the state that has always uh, really stuck with me. So uh, he was somebody that described things in a way that really appealed to me. And I think personally, one of the things that attracted to me uh, to not only his books, but also to these journal entries, in the journal entries, he refers to them as hinge days. And I, as a sailor, I call them waypoints or <clears throat> moments in our life where we're faced with a very difficult and important decision that shapes the rest of our life from that point forward. 
And I think Ivan Doig had a very strong sense of when those decisions were made and what the implications of the, those decisions might be. And I think there's something about being diagnosed with a serious illness that causes you to reflect on the decisions that you've made that have had a strong bearing on the course your life has taken. And I was very, um, I was very moved by him. Uh, it, as far as I'm concerned, Ivan Doig uh, writes about that uh, in a way that few others can. Um, I would, Vladimir Nabokov does, and possibly Richard White um, is right as somebody that does. But Ivan Doig is almost magical in his ability to go back in time, revisit those decisions, and it's something that I do uh, in the book as well. Great, thank you. Um, what I'd like to do now is involve some of the other panelists in responding to some questions about uh, the writing process linked to um, Ivan's disease, and just about creativity in general as uh, we think about mortality. Um, entries five and seven, could we get those, Lisa? December 30th, 2007. We are going through this season in an oddly thrilling household glow, the writing of 11th man burning in me like a filament. I woke at 2.30 this morning, two of the book's final sentences clear in my head. I put in a big day of manuscript work yesterday, Saturday, and the couple of complex scenes yet to be done brim in me with that feeling I have only had a few other times with books, that if I could just work for the next hundred hours straight, the book would be done. It's never that basic, or I don't have the iron constitution to do it that way, but even as I contradictorily pace and push myself just enough, these are monumental days. July 21st, 2009. I don't know that I can continue the determined writing pace that produced the 11th man and work song in the past, what, three years? With the stem cell transplant and thalidomide prednisone thrown in, but that is still the direction I should go. So, we're talking about someone who knows he's dying, and we're talking about his response to that through not only recording his thoughts about that process, but also through recording his thoughts about what it takes to remain alive and contest a certain kind of fate that awaits us all. And I'm just very curious to hear from my fellow writers up here about Ivan's creative process during this time of just extraordinary distress and how that process actually worked. I mean, I, I frankly can't imagine generating, we're counting now, four or five books, I mean, not articles, not essays, we're talking Books. I mean, these are Ivan Doig scale books. I mean, he's writing constantly. And I find that to be, that, that kind of outpouring to be absolutely extraordinary. So I'm trying to understand, I guess, a little bit as I was just thinking about this evening, to try to get some help from you folks here about the drive. I mean, this is not somebody who hangs it up and says, well, it's over. This is somebody who on a daily basis is working away at getting thoughts down. And writing isn't just, you just don't move from one word to the next, right? I mean, you write, you revise, you reorganize, you're trying to think where you're going, and it's a remarkable journey. So, um, David, why don't we start with you, and then we'll just open this to everybody. Great, well, thank you. Um, I find it humbling to talk about this to you know kind of put myself on the same podium with Ivan in terms of the creative process um, so I'm not really sure I can speak to that directly um, but I think I'm going to actually backtrack and answer a different question as politicians always do um, and and but I think it will circle back to this and it really relates to the archives um, 
I think the archi Ivan's archives, in my experience, and I've spent some time um, poking around archives in, for research in various books, I think Ivan's archives, to me, are a unique window into the life of the mind of a great writer. And, um, you know, I think it's pretty rare in this day and age that somebody committed to paper or computer as much about his inner life and experiences as Ivan did. You know, I went poking around the archives and reading the journals and the note cards, you kind of feel like you're with Dickens or Trollope. You know, I, I remember, you know, reading, okay, so Dickens wrote these vast novels and he also had a vast correspondence and he wrote articles and he went to America and lectured and wrote about that and how the heck did he have the time? I, I feel that way with Ivan too and knowing him, living up the street from him, and there I was sitting at my computer, poking, poking away and writing my few words, and Ivan had this immense output of published and unpublished work. So I think the archives, uh, you know, if you haven't spent time with them, do, and if you have a favorite Ivan Doig novel um, or memoir, read the journals that were written during the time that he composed that book, and you will be immensely rewarded um, just by seeing Ivan's mind at play. So getting back to the question, um, you know, to me, I think it's an incredible act of courage that Ivan faced up to all of this. He didn't, there was no shirking there, he, you know, the, the card, you know, um, that, that I think is, to me, the most moving, um, invariably fatal, which multiple myeloma is, um, damn, but then so is life. Um, Ivan knew that, and he wrote about it, he faced up to it, he was fascinated by his treatments, he talked about them to me openly, and with a lot of detail and concentration. He was a very private man. Even though we were good friends, there was a lot of stuff that I've never talked about and I would never dare ask him about. But this aspect of his life, he did want to talk about and did want to open up about. So I felt that it was part and parcel of the creative process that you mentioned, that he needed to write about it. He needed to write in order to live. And if he were still with us, which we all wish like hell he were, he would be writing about everything all the time. That's, that's you know, he thought, he, he used to have this expression, thinking through your fingers. And that's how Ivan lived his life. And so, it, you know, when you think about when he got that diagnosis, he could have gone in a number of directions. And I think, I think withdrawal is probably one avenue that seems like a natural one to take. But Ivan didn't withdraw. And um, it's just amazing to have the privilege to see, and you know, we're hearing snippets from the journals now to, to kind of peer over his shoulder as he did that. Um, so yeah, as, as for the creative process, I, you know, it's, it's easy to talk about in somebody else. It's hard in yourself. So I, I think I'll just leave it there. Carol, would you like to? Well, what Ivan did after the diagnosis was to write faster. <laughs> <laughs> he once said, he might have, something he might have said to you, David, that if given the chance, he could write until he was 150. He never ran out of ideas. So his idea of a limited future was write as fast as he could without letting up at all uh, the, in the craft of it. And uh, yes, I think he did have to write. I mean, that is the thing that he most of all wanted to do. He never found it easy. Uh, particularly the first drafting, you know, he said he was a more natural editor than a writer. But whatever, 
Um, he simply stayed at work. He never gave up. Um, and, you know, even as the, in the latter stages of, uh, of his life, he never gave up, and that is why I think David wound up at the Doig house helping Ivan with the last few edits of Last Bus. What was that, a day before he died, two days before he died? Um, and our great friend, the wonderful poet Linda Beards, said of that, that's on a film that's in the archive, that's exactly what I would have expected of Ivan. And so did I. Thank you. Um, Todd, let's turn to you, because in some ways, I think what brought us all together here was um, an idea you had to make this medical journey and the journey through Ivan's creative work a part of the discussion. So what moves you? What do you take from these journals? That What insights into the writing process do you derive from these? So what was really interesting was being able to get together in your living room and talk about the old days in Chicago. I too came from Chicago and one of the things you all need to know about Carol is that uh, she started as a, a journalist in Chicago the same as Ivan did. And we talked about getting into the zone, how writers get into the zone, how hard it is to get into the zone, but when you get disrupted from it, it's almost this agonizing thing. And so when I think about Ivan, there's the disease element, but there's also the element that it's, there's fundamental struggle and suffering that writers go through anyway. And I think one of the nightmares of, for all of us is, is that we die suddenly and then our stuff is left for our survivors to pick through. And what, what really fascinated me about Ivan's archives is that he was very meticulous and in, in fact he saved lots of things that would be seemingly innocuous and yet they're tied together the love letters to you in the morning the notes about writing the observations about things that were going on and and so what I think is beautiful about the archives and gives them a value added is that in some ways he was anticipating someone in the future coming into this in the same way that you two would set off on research trips and discover uh, characters and listen um, to be able to hear the vernacular that they spoke. And so he leaves all of these crumbs of clues to go through that can reward one ultimately to come in and write the Ivan Doig biography. If it's there to be written for someone who wants to do it, or at least there's material to do it. So for me, what was just fascinating was this golden opportunity with archives, living archives, to be able to come in. And um, it's, it's truly a gift. We talk about libraries being becoming archaic. Well, these, these archives of Ivan Doig is it was by design to have these things. You can go in and get a real sense of, of who he was. And frankly, I think it's even, it's as interesting as the characters that he developed in his books because he, became, he becomes a character in his own story. So if you have thoughts. You know, I suppose he thought it would be fine if somebody would write a biography of him someday, although I'm not absolutely sure of that. <laughs> but I think what he wanted his archive to do was to teach anyone who wanted to learn to write to do it, or someone who already knew how to write to do it better. And it's all there. Uh, one of the things about the manuscripts, for example, that he left, um, the manuscripts of his novels are, there are various numbers of them, but I think they go up to maybe five 
uh, on one of his books. And you can actually see, you can't really do that anymore in, in this electronic age because things are edited on the screen and the old ones go away. Well, I haven't had all this on paper. And so you can trace through, you can see what he did, you can see how he edited his work. And then beyond that, in its final stage, you can see what his editor Becky did. And so there's all kinds of textbook there for anyone who wants to access it. And I find that pretty striking. Uh, and given that we're in the electronic age where things just disappear into the universe, I don't know how much more of this, if any, we're going to get from writers in the future. Can I just jump in sure. for a second and pick up on something Carol said? Um, you know, I was talking about how much Ivan wrote and how prolific his journals and cards and so on were, but Carol, you know, said Ivan it didn't come easy when he was writing those novels or memoirs, and I remember him telling me once, I'm a bleeder when I write. It comes out drop by drop, and it's true, and, you know, you see the difference between the journals, which didn't come out drop by drop. He would just sit there and, you know, kind of think out loud. But then when the time came to compose for publication, it, he, there was this constant wrestling match. And I think anybody who's written anything knows all about that match. Um, but what, what's striking, one of the things that was striking to me about Ivan was that he, never, he neither complained about it nor puffed it up. It wasn't like, oh, I work so damn hard, you know, every sentence is polished to a fairly well, or, um, you know, it's just so difficult to write. Ugh. He didn't complain, he didn't brag. It was, he was the consummate professional, but it didn't come easy. And as a friend and as, as you know, somebody who kind of looked up to Ivan in every way, it was an amazing example of how to be a professional. And Ivan loved that word. And whenever he used it, you know, he or she is a real professional. There was no higher praise. And so I think reading, you know, I, I keep coming back to this reading, delving into the archives, and then seeing those drips coming out one by one and, and the beautiful novels that, that those created. It's just, it's, there's nothing like it. Thanks very much. Um, Rob, let me turn to you with a question because I, my guess is as a physician you don't have many novelists that you get to work with um, in terms of expressing ideas about uh, what they're thinking about um, uh, you know, confronting mortality. Uh, but you also um, have some insights into how people, as they approach the end of their life, come to terms with this sense that being creative matters so much. And I'm wondering if that is part of the world that you see in working with patients, if this idea of this kind of um, drive to complete, this drive to get things done seems to be um, more common than not, or if Ivan is really unusual in the degree to which he pushes that creative spark. Um, he's definitely unusual. Um, <laughs> So just picking up on something that David said, that when he got this diagnosis, he could, have, he could have taken many paths. And one of them is withdrawal. And another one is self-pity. And I can tell you that's a dark road that goes nowhere. And he didn't do that. Um, and so as a doc, another, just as a preface to what I'm about to say, I'm, I'm the only non-writer up here, and, uh, but I will throw down with anybody in this room as a Doig superfan. Um, <laughs> I have made a pilgrimage to White Sulphur Springs, Montana when I was 25, and it's a long way from Cleveland, Ohio to White Sulphur Springs, so um, I'm not a casual fan. Uh, and so when I sat down with the archive, um, I got to look at this, this House of Sky is an iconic book for me. It's probably one of my top five of all time. And I got to sit down with the actual last draft of his book. And it, he was marking it 
this is right before it's going to the publisher, right? Still in that iconic, you know, first paragraph, that first page, he's still making corrections after the fourth or fifth draft. And every one of them made it better as a reader, I can tell you that. Um, and, I, and that was the first thing that he ever wrote. And I felt very privileged to actually, as a reader, get to physically see that. And in this dusty old file, in his medical file, I found a spiral bound notebook at the very end of it. And I flipped through it and it was the notebook that he kept in the last stages of his life. I also got to read the last thing that he ever wrote. So as a reader, I got to read the first thing and the last thing that he ever wrote. So in answer to your question, I'm just giving you that background. Uh, I'm not a casual fan. I was insanely curious about how he handled you know, the end of his life, knowing that he had a long time to think about it. And it wasn't, I didn't get to read the journals until much later on, they weren't part of the archive. So I was just going through his papers and he has these incredibly funny quips. Um, Kenning told me I couldn't swear, but I'm gonna quote Ivan. He says, uh, um, multiple myeloma is like the waiting room of hell furnished with side effects. And I, as a doc, I cannot think of a better description of that disease. That is perfect. So when we went out to see Carol, uh, and, and another thing, I think as a super fan, you think that, I think, as a non-writer, that all writers of Ivan's stature are these geniuses and this work just flows from their pen. And, you know, after they've gotten done killing an elk and, like, you know, sleeping with beautiful women all day. Um, and, and I had this romantic notion in my head. And um, when you look at the archives, you realize he's, he wasn't that guy, right? He was, he was a nerd like me, you know, who kept note cards and, and shuffled them into other papers. So I dispelled myself of that notion. But I was really hoping that when we went out to see Carol, I was going to, you know, get this big epiphany. She was going to tell me, okay, what was this big epiphany that he had at the end of his life? And uh, I was pretty disappointed. <laughs> Carol's very charming and well-spoken. And uh, I pushed her pretty hard. And she, you know, I said, walked out of there and said, where's my GD epiphany, you know? And uh, it wasn't until a few days later of just thinking about our conversation that the epiphany was that there wasn't an epiphany because he didn't need an epiphany because he got up after he knew he was going to die. He got up every day and he did the same thing he had always done. He got up early. He was like a, he was like a blue collar worker. I mean, he packed his lunch took it to the mill, and he did his work. And the reason there was no epiphany is because he was already living his best life. And there wasn't, it didn't get any better for Ivan Doig. Um, and so that was a real revelation to me as a super fan and as a doc. Um, and oh, it was only later after the journals came out that there's actually a quote from him exactly to that effect. Um, but it took me a while to get there. Yeah. Great, thanks. And so, Brett, you're, I mean, you write about <clears throat> your own illness and you're diagnosed with this extraordinarily, extraordinarily serious disease. And I think many people, when they get that kind of diagnosis and undergo the treatment, there's a sense that things are really coming apart. And yet the book you wrote is really about things coming together. And your book is a, really quite an extraordinary um, story about history and memory. So is this, when, when, does that, when does that coming together part happen? Well, that's very kind of you to say that. I, I'm not sure that I felt like it ever came together, but it, I appreciate that. I mean, my project started very simply. I was dying in an emergency room, and I had a bunch of emergency room doctors looking over my bed saying, do you have a family history of illness? And I remember thinking to myself, I could lecture you now for hours on state building in the 17th century throughout Asia, and I couldn't tell them the first thing about my own family. 
and I could and so I thought, you know, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> and so after I actually got out of the hospital, I, you know, undertook a four-year odyssey to better understand the medical story of my own family, but to deconstruct my own body in a medical way to better understand how it was that my bone marrow and my cells and my immune system function. And frankly, it scared the shit out of me. And I mean that quite simply. I can't hardly read my own book anymore. And even having this conversation right now scares me. And so when I first, when Jan first sent out those quotes, what struck me was not the acceleration of the writing, but the sort of candidness that he could approach the medical deconstruction of his own body in his pharmacological state and the discussions of the real me versus the pharmacological me. And it takes a lot of courage to look into your own health that closely and to engage it. And I was just struck by the degree to which he had the courage to do it and to and talk about it openly in those journals. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. So the first thing I thought was, I know from personal experience that a deep investigation into your own body can be terrifying. In fact, what I always think is, I can't believe everybody's just not dropping dead of this stuff because the body is so complicated, right? You know, that's the first thing you think. And so I just the boldness that he could do this. The second thing is, and I just hope you'll just indulge me for a second on that. I am by training, I teach, I teach Asia. And so I am kind of Buddhist inclined towards these kind of things. And when, the first, when I started reading these quotes uh, from um, Ivan's uh, diary, a quote came to mind from a 14th century monk. And I think it's incredibly apropos. So I'll just read it, it's very brief. So this is by a monk by the name of Kenko, who is a very wise man. And he wrote this. He said, in all things, it is the beginnings and ends that are interesting. Does the love between men and women refer only to the moments when they are in each other's arms? The man who grieves over a love affair broken off before it was fulfilled, who bewails empty vows, who spends long autumn nights alone, who lets his thoughts wander to distant skies, who yearns for the past in a dilapidated house, such a man truly knows what love means. And that would be the second thing I'd say. If, if we could excuse Kenko for his 14th century impulse to use a masculine pronoun, what these entries revealed to me was the appreciation for the people in your life. And the expressions of love for you, Carol, are remarkable. I mean, the one thing that having a, an experience with death or near death does is it sharpens your appreciation for the people you love and you care for. And when I looked at one of the very first ones, he says, I told Carol, through a lot of emotional choking up, one of the countless things I despise about all of this, but we are going to have to get used to, that I don't feel I have great unachieved things I have to get to or places I must see. I simply want to have as much more time with her as we can manage. That really struck out as a very sincere statement. Yeah. Yeah. So can I add to that yeah. real quick? Oh, yes. So that's the quote I was actually talking about when I said I read it in the journal. It sort of confirmed what Carol had said. The other thing I'd say about the journals is, uh, so Kenning gave me two warnings. Don't swear and don't refer to I Ivan. Didn't you didn't get the warning? All right. He said, don't refer to Ivan as a dude. But I'm going to say, the dude is funny. I mean, you read those, I was reading those journal articles and I was literally laughing out loud. And I mean, I thought, buddy, you're going to hell. You're laughing at the, the words of a dying man. But he, it, a lot of those entries are really funny. Um, and just his self-deprecating humor and his wry observations about his side effects and uh, his sex life, <laughs> he's talking about being on thalidomide and getting asked more about his sex life than he was since the Air Force. Um, it's, it's just really, um, again, it's a story, it's a, it's a happy story. It's a, it's a joyful story, I think, even though he's... Yeah, and the story about friendship is so important. I'd like to turn to that briefly, but just in terms of his language, I mean, the way he talks about illness. At one point, he describes himself as a human pillbox. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's incredible 
the way the words capture the reality of what he's um, trying to come to terms with. Um, but friends mattered a great deal to Ivan and to you too, Carol. Um, and I, what I'd like to do is um, just listen to a couple of um, additional readings. Um, could we get entry two, please, Lisa? February 15th, 2007. David questioned me about the physical side of the treatment I'm going through, then asked about the psychological aspect. I said something about there really being no choice in girding and doing it, not nearly quick-headed enough to lay out the better answer that occurred to me first thing this morning, that I don't have any why me in this. I've always figured life coldly asks any of us, why the hell not you? And therefore it becomes a matter of doing the medical chores and seeing what happens. So there's a, a social aspect to this disease and Ivan drew and Carol, both of you drew on, on friends. I mean, you didn't keep them away. And I think that's an important part of the story is that they were very much a part of your lives as this disease progressed. So is that something you could say maybe a couple of words about? Well, uh, he wouldn't have wanted his friends not to know what the medical situation was. And uh, so we, at some point, how early was that? I think it was a couple of years in. A couple I don't, years in, I don't yeah. think he, you told us right away. Yeah. I, I could check back with in the journals, but yeah. Yeah. I think it was a couple of years. But um, anyway, we at some reasonably early point, we came to the conclusion that... Um, no, we weren't going to make our social life into medical reports. Um, but Ivan, particularly I think in the case of David and his wife Kate, and a few other in the what I would say would be the uh, tightest circle of our friends, um, he would be happy to report at the start of a uh, social occasion, and then that was that, you know, then on to other things. You know what be moaning, I think, yeah. David. It was more like a report. Oh, Is that yeah. fair to oh, say? Oh, yeah. And, you know, somebody mentioned how Ivan did not change his habits, his professional habits. He still went to work every day. But he didn't change as a friend either. And now that I'm thinking about this, it never occurred to me how extraordinary that was, that there was no bid for sympathy nor was there pride, nor was there kind of chip on the shoulder, like, you know, well, what I'm going through, you'll never understand. He was himself, and he didn't expect special treatment at all. It was just, and it, nor, but nor did he shirk from the truth. So, yeah, it's, it's funny, and it never occurred to me till now how extraordinary that was that he was himself, you know, fully and didn't milk it. I mean, God, I think if I had something like this, I would milk it for everything I was worth. I would, you know, whatever. Ivan didn't do that. Well, you know, I have a hunch that, hunch that some of this might have been from journalism training. I'd like to hear what Todd might have to say about that. But you tell it like it is. You know, you tell it true to the best of your ability. I, I think everybody in this room will know that he did not write melodramatically. And the beauty of the beauty, the profound beauty, is the fact that he didn't didn't write in those flourishes, but the profundity of day-to-day -day encounters with everyday people. And I don't think he ever betrayed himself in that, in the way that, and David, maybe you can jump in because you were there as well, but that staying tr true to oneself is something that, that, that comes through. One thing I wanted to just add, there's an assumption when you have a famous writer like Ivan Doig that things might have come easy. And you spoke about the struggle even before he got sick with some of his famous books that got rejected by publishers. 
and I think people would be stunned to hear about that, that going back to journalism and be, he was actually a freelance writer and, and you went through that at Medill as well and the fact that he was prepared through the rigors of being a writer in some ways to deal, I, I, I'm just presuming here, to deal with hardship in a, in a way, in the way that he wrote about that. But if you could speak a little bit and share uh, with folks here about getting some of those books for which he was most famous, getting them into print, the fact that they weren't a, a sure deal. Well, it was particularly this House of Sky, because here's this 37-year-old uh, guy who he would have been at the time, writing about his family. And as one of my best friends said, who's Ivan that anybody would want to write this, or would want to read this, you know? And, but what Ivan did was he mapped out, again, maybe in journalistic fashion, that he, um, he asked one of our best friends if she would mind being his agent, because he didn't have an agent. He hadn't had a book published. So what was this guy doing? Well, he took the, one of the grittiest of our friends, and what she would do is she would send out four to six letters to that many publishers at a time uh, with a sample of the uh, manuscript for this House of Sky. And um, began getting answers, none of them saying yes, but all of them sort of in baffled admiration for what they were looking at. But they didn't think it would be a commercial success. It's just celebrated its 40th anniversary and it's still selling. <laughs> So much for that idea, right? But he simply said, and he, and he went to the old publication, the uh, publisher's guide that we used at the time, and he would pick out from these mainstream publishing houses um, associate editors. That is not the editor-in-chief who was going to be too busy with desk work to get uh, to pay too much attention, but uh, somebody down the line, just a little bit, who might be interested. And it was the uh, 13th answer that came from uh, an editor named Carol Hill at Harcourt in New York. And she said she liked the book. She's going to take it to her advisory council. She'd get back to him uh, in... I think it was 10 days, she did. And they offered him a contract. Uh, it wouldn't make you rich, but it was a mainstream publisher with a good contract. And that's the book that was nominated for the National Book Award. So he, he plotted it, and he stuck with it, and did it in a very workmanlike way. Thank you. Um, we'll move this towards conclusion. I'd like to just go around and ask the panelists for their thoughts, some final thoughts before we turn to some questions from you about uh, takeaway lessons from these journals. I mean, what, what, are we, what are we supposed to learn from this archive? Brian, I'm going to start with you, just because you're looking at me so quizzically. <laughs> sort of, why me? <laughs> um, I would only say that um, it's a good idea to keep a journal. Right? I mean, I think maybe, I mean, you would take it for granted that someone of Ivan Doig's caliber would be writing all the time and practicing and thinking. But I think the art of um, keeping a journal has sort of fallen out of fashion a little bit. But I think it's a great way to um, collect your thoughts, um, to think through things um, in a way. And one of the nice things about these entries is you're invited into that process. And so it just reminded me of the power of daily writing and daily thinking, and I'm just not sure many of us are doing that anymore. And just also just to echo what Kenning said at the beginning, um, all of you know or should know that all of this is available to you. It's, and how do I keep a journal? What does a journal look like? 
You can get into this archive online thanks to the heroic works of Professor Zuhan or colleagues in special collections. I mean, it's really just incredible what is there for you to, for all of us, to learn from about so many facets of Ivan Doig's life. So, I think my answer is going to be a little different than everybody else's. I mean, for me, it, this guy was a dream patient. I mean, it's so hard as a doc to get people to articulate what they're, so much of what I do in trying to diagnose disease and treat disease and figure out what, what's the best course of action depends on what patients tell me, you know? That's still the fundamental, even with all the high tech stuff, the MRIs, the CTs, the this, that, still sitting down and talking to people and, and saying, how do you feel? And you would not believe how difficult it is to extract just some of that basic information from patients, and I'll tell you a body story about that afterwards, but um, Ivan gives these incredible descriptions of what it's like to be on prednisone and what it's like to have side effects of these medications and how he's, what neuropathy feels like. And for me as a doc, that was just priceless. I mean, because I, I never, to, to sort of hear that from like your literary hero and see that as, a, sort of as a benefit to your profession. That's, that was probably one of the most striking things for me. I, I think what struck me is something we mentioned at dinner, which is the collaboration that went on with you and your husband. And he was, uh, you were his best set of eyes. Um, you were there to uh, read his manuscripts and it really offers insight into that dance that the two of you did and one of the things that that you said that he mentions about some of those triumphs of a great writing day and the fact that these guys would at the end of the day go in and have a cocktail or something standing with the sound out your window in the Olympic Mountains is that you know, he spent all this time in isolation writing and grinding it out and that the two of you at the end of the day could celebrate these, these victories that you had even as he got sick, it was really touching. Great, thanks Todd. David, what about your thoughts here? Yeah, well, uh, once again, I'm not gonna answer the question, but whatever. Um, I was once chatting with Ivan about giving a talk and uh, I was giving a talk at a high school in the Midwest, and there was time for the Q&A. And I said, Ivan, I got the weirdest question from one of these kids. It was, Mr. Laskin, what's your favorite war? And I was like, hard to choose. They're all so wonderful in their own way. But, and I said, well, what about you, Ivan? What was, you know, what was one of your favorite or oddest questions? And he said, well, I was also at a school, and a kid said to me, Ivan, who was your first love? Or Mr. Doig, who was your first love? And he said, the answer is, I married her. And for somebody who didn't open up a lot, that was important. So here she is. <laughs> oh, thank you, David. <laughs> well, I, I would like to say that what Ivan and I had was a partnership. We both got to do what we wanted to do. He wrote, and I taught, and yes, we did get together at the end of the day and uh, enjoy the view out the window. Um, but it was like that. So, you know, I don't feel that I gave up anything for his writing career. Uh, I think we added to each other as we went along. And it worked out very well for half a century, so I, <laughs> I cannot... Uh, I cannot say more than that. No, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, Kenning, I'm now going to have to turn to you or to Lissa for the final and the final video. You can spend two minutes on Google, type in multiple myeloma, and one of the things that comes out very quickly it is invariably fatal. There's no cure. Ivan knew that. Ivan was not fooled and would not ever not face the truth. 
but didn't talk about that. Never said that to me. And interestingly, when I was at the archives, um, and you know, looking through these series of three by five cards, and on one of the cards it said "invariably fatal." I, he he knew that he had a death sentence. It strikes me that when Ivan died, he had nothing to regret, except that his life was too short. Ivan was he was a good he lived by his principles, and um, you know, that's 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 a great beacon. So we'll do this twice. Um, first, I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking our wonderful panelists. And next, we'll take some questions from you. And then we'll thank our panelists again, then thank all of you. But and you have the, okay. So I think um, probably it's kind of hard for us to see down here, um, but if you are not timid, raise your hands. Can you put the lights on? Um. Hi, Bob. This oh, is, yes. This is Paul. I'm right in front <laughs> yeah, of you here. Hi. <laughs> hi. So this is a question for Todd. And we we're talking about um, Ivan Dyke's journals and archives, and you run an organization now called Mountain Journal. Do you feel like some of this work that you're doing now is similar to what Ivan did on his own life, but you're doing it for the ecosystem and you're doing it so other people have access um, into things that are important that aren't always discussed. I, I think that what Mountain Journal is about is it's about looking at the West through the lens of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And I think what Ivan did extraordinarily well is uh, looking at place-based journalism through the eyes of people who actually live there because you, all of the stories of landscape are stories of people and how we relate to them. So thanks for the question. Um, the one thing I will say about Mountain Journal is I think that these two stories, Rob's story, which was really remarkable with the physician, is what we try to do is tell place-based stories. And, you know, to say that, that Ivan Doig has an influence the development of Mountain Journal would, would be a lie. He, he certainly has. And um, so... I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I would love to hear what Carol thinks about Ivan as uh, someone who, you know, I, I don't think he called himself an environmentalist, but he sure cared about the landscape and the future. I, I would, if you don't mind, I would love to hear your thoughts. Well, yes, he certainly did, and uh, we also got out in the Pacific Northwest a lot. We also hiked in the Bob Marshall. Uh, you know, we did a lot of things right out there in the landscape. But Ivan was not going to preach. You know, he was going to tell it through his stories, through his people. And yet I have a feeling that people reading his books really do get it, and that's part of why readers are drawn to his work. Uh, he had a reverence for the land. I mean, even the hard part of it and the hard life of the people living it. But he thought they were worthy people. Uh, he loved the land. Um, I hesitate to think what he would be thinking or saying if he were here today. Uh, Maybe we just all have to keep at it as long as any of us can and see what we can straighten up. So, again, any other questions? Um, oh, but Mary, we're going to go to the back first. Uh, 
I guess this is directed at, at Carol. Uh, so in his, his first major work, This House of Sky, there was an extended disquisition on death and dying, but it was his father and, and emphysema. It was a different death. But I wonder, I mean, it was written with such a maturity, and he was obviously affected by it. Did this, in turn, affect his own approach uh, to death and dying? I'm sorry, I didn't quite get your last couple of sentences there. How did this affect Ivan's own approach to death and dying, having witnessed it so yeah. closely uh, with his father? Yeah. Well, he never particularly said anything about that relationship, but undoubtedly uh, his dad's travails over a long period of time with emphysema uh, affected Ivan and I think matured him and perhaps in a way got him ready to handle a situation like his own. You know, I've never quite thought about it that way. Thank you so much for that question. And Mary Murphy. Well, I was going to ask a similar question in that... Oh, here we go. Um, I was going to ask a similar question in that Ivan grew up with people whose bodies were worked really hard and who knew that kind of um, physicality of work very much. And then thinking about his grandmother, his mother's early death, and his father, yeah. I, you know, that's what I wonder too, if that was a way of um, him learning how to deal with this, and that he learned to deal with his life through language and writing, and that would be the same approach he would take to his own death. Well, I think you folks are writing the story. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he didn't sit around telling me about, he didn't sit around telling me about that, but as much as, as can be found, would be found, I think, in the journals and in that file, the medical journal file, as he called it, in the archives. And I would say, if you're interested in any of that, go, go do some reading in those. You know, you could start as uh, I believe we did in getting this program going and that Jan so well did was to take excerpts from his journal beginning about the time that uh, he was diagnosed with the MGUS, the unspecified significance that Rob is talking about there, and read through some, um, maybe even kind of skip through between then and his death in 2015 and see what you think. Um, I think as we all do, there was, but there was a lot, an awful lot of it in his family of illness, uh, of uh, hard life, uh, that sort of thing. His grandmother, bless her heart, she lived to 80. Um, through all the travails, uh, through all the hard work, Ivan's only question when Grandma came to visit was how to keep her busy. <laughs> so um, I think all of that pertains, but he never did, he never wrote a book beyond this house of sky that gave a kind of global answer to it. But I think you're all on a track that I find uh, very telling. So there is more time for questions during a reception. Mm -hmm. So I think what we might do is adjourn um, in the direction of the foyer for a reception. But before we do so, um, I'd like to thank um, Kenning Arlich. I'd like to thank his staff. 
I'd like to thank the marvelous librarians who have made this evening and this archive possible. My uh, fellow associate director of the Ivan Doig Center, Mary Murphy, and the director of that center, Susan Colleen, for all of their contributions to this. I'd like to thank the panelists. And above all this evening, I'd like to thank Carol Doig for everything that you have done to advance this archive. Thank you. Thank you.